Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for the feedback. I love that. Welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Katie O'Donnell. I'm an event staffer here at Politics and Prose, where we're now back to hosting in-person events, along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. We've also relocated both our branch locations at Union Market and The Wharf and have started hosting events there as well. So for a full list of everything that we have available, please go to our website at politics-pros.com. So just a few boring housekeeping items. Please silence your cell phones to not disrupt the event. Um, when we get to the part of tonight's uh, event for audience questions, we have a microphone that's placed here. It's probably hidden for some of you behind this white pillar. We do ask that if you're able to, to go to the microphone to ask questions. That way it's captured in our audio and video recording tonight, as well as heard by everybody in the audience. And the signing line that we'll do after the event concludes will also begin at this infamous pillar. And then lastly, at the end of the event, please fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help the staff out. So without further ado, on to the better part of this introduction. We're really excited to be welcoming Sloane Crosby here tonight for the launch day of her new book, Grief is for People. Before I launch into, Crosley, sorry, before I launch into the actual uh, part of the introduction, the Washington Post wrote a glowing review of the book today, so please check it out if you haven't already. So Grief is for People is a deeply moving and surprisingly suspenseful portrait of friendship and a book about loss packed with verve for life. After the pain and confusion of losing her closest friend to suicide, Crosley looks for example for answers excuse me, in friends, philosophy, art, hoping for a framework more useful than the unavoidable stages of grief. Crosley's search for truth is frank, darkly funny, and gilded with resounding empathy. Upending the grief memoir, Grief is for People is the category-defying story of a struggle to hold on to the past without being consumed by it. A modern elegy, it rises precisely to console and challenge our notions of mourning during, during these grief-stricken times. Sloan Crosley is the author of novels Cult Classic and The Clasp and three essay collections, Look Alive Out There and the New York Times bestsellers, I Was Told There Be Cake and How Did You Get This Number. Crosley will be in conversation this evening with Kevin Young, Kevin is the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Young is also the author of 15 books of poetry and prose, most recently Stones, which was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. His nonfiction book, Bunk, was long listed for the National Book Award. So pre please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose this evening, Sloane Crosley, I'll get her last name right, I promise, Sloane Crosley and Kevin Young. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna say you. Um, I was gonna tell them you had to go. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Oh wow. <laughs> this is a proper story time chair. Um, thank you for coming out. Uh, it's so nice to see all your faces. Um, I'm just gonna read for a little bit for about six or seven minutes, so you have a sense of the book, um, before dragging Kevin, who actually did not leave, <clears throat> out here with me. Um. The great thing is I'm going to read from the beginning of the book, so there's no setup really required. You should know, I guess, that it starts with a burglary before the death in question. Um, and I guess the only downside is it's not particularly funny. But um, let's see, you didn't even laugh at that. <laughs> so that's not good. But OK, so here is the beginning of the book. All burglaries are alike, but every burglary is uninsured in its own way. On June 27, 2019, at 5.15 p.m., I leave my apartment for one hour and come home to find all my jewelry missing. This is the front entrance of the story, the facts of the case. Container first, emotion second. As if by offering up an order of events, the significance of those events will fill itself in automatically. But that story ends before it begins, without ever really being told. The thief enters the story through my bedroom window. He scurries up the corroded metal steps of my fire escape. He lifts the screen, then the glass, crouching to make himself small. Into the stillness of my bedroom come his dirty boots, sinking into the white comforter. To be fair, he has no choice but to step on the comforter. The bed is flush with the window because it takes up half the room. Once inside, the thief takes a total of five minutes and 41 pieces of jewelry. Amid the otherwise unremarkable loot are my grandmother's amber amulet, the size of an apricot. 
as well as her green cocktail ring, a dome with tiers of tourmaline. Think kryptonite, think dish soap. But let us pause here before you get too turned around. My grandmother was an awful person. I've never met anyone who misses her. I should also say that my cousin is in this audience. <laughs> Ask him after. She was abusive and creative about it. If she was irritated at one of her children, she would instruct the other two to give the offending child the silent treatment. When my mother was a kid, she would be sent to her room with the understanding that my grandmother would be up at any minute with a belt. Sometimes she showed, sometimes she didn't. Sometimes she'd dig her nails into my mother's arm until the skin broke, an act of violence exacerbated by the bafflement that followed. Darling, whatever have you done to yourself? By the time this woman and I overlapped in sentience and height, she was cordial enough, hinged enough. Still, the longest conversation I had with her was the day of my college graduation. She swanned into town, chucked a pearl bracelet across a restaurant table, and offered to pay for graduate school. She rescinded the offer after I mailed my applications. I don't know why. The bracelet I got to keep. Well, for a while, anyway. My efforts to repurpose her objects to give them the soul they never had have been slower than their financial appreciation. The necklace originally belonged to my great-grandmother, and apparently she was no picnic either. I have long suspected these objects of not wanting to be on me, the green ring sensing an unfamiliar pulse pass through it. My mother, the least favored child, was relegated to the footnotes of the will, so these items are my sole inheritance. But I have thought of them as cursed, I've never worn them on planes. And now a stranger is in my home, packing up the remnants of a cruel woman and carting them off. Unfortunately, they are worth quite a bit, worth quite a bit of money. Even I do not know how much. I've never had them appraised, which would have been necessary to get them insured. Maybe because appraisal always seemed too adult, like hiring a lawyer or buying a water pick. Maybe because I have felt about these things the way I have felt about my grandmother, that it was not my job to look after them, but their job to look after me. The thief also steals my other grandmother's silver engagement band, a charm bracelet built for smaller wrists, and a cow-shaped pin I found on the street in Madison, Wisconsin. All I have been left and all I would leave are being dumped into a stranger's backpack. But it's indulgent to, still, to tell the story like this, in the present tense, as if I can still stop it, as if there's an ankle to be grabbed. There's no ankle. I can't stop what's already happened, but this is the only way I can explain the events of June 27th, 2019, or the days that follow it. 30 days down to the hour that will be bookended by personal loss. 30 days down to the hour that I cannot know will be a precursor to a year of global loss. Eventually, I will look back on the burglary and see it for what it is, a dark gift of delineation. I know when my first bomb went off. Not everyone gets to know. And no one is obliged to learn something from loss. This is a horrible thing we do to the newly stricken, encouraging them to remember the good times while they're still in the fetal position, like feeding steak to a baby. I have read the grief literature and the grief philosophy and, God help me, listen to the grief podcasts. And the most practical thing I have learned is the power of the present tense. The past is quicksand, and the future is unknowable. But in the present, you get to float. Nothing is missing. Nothing is hypothetical. In truth, I am writing these words on the evening of August 27, 2019. It's a Tuesday. The Amazon is on fire. It's been two months since the burglary, and it's been one month since the violent death of my dearest friend. This occurred on the evening of July 27, 2019. I will be editing these sentences much later, after several dozen 27ths have passed, when the gap between the past and the present is more of a chasm. By then, I will be better able to control how I think of these absences. I will be able to proceed with a conversation without flinching when someone mentions the wrong movie or the wrong song. But right now, I am in denial that my friend is gone. I am, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, in denial that the jewelry is gone. Human beings are the only anim animals that experience denial. All creatures will try to survive under attack, 
will burrow when under siege or limp through the forest. But they recognize trouble when it hits. Not one fish in the history of fish, having gotten its fins chewed off, needs another fish's perspective. I don't know, Tom, that looks pretty bad. <laughs> Denial is humankind's specialty, our handy aversion. We are so allergic to our own mortality, we'll do anything to make it not so. Denial is also the weirdest stage of grief because it so closely mimics stupidity. But it can't be helped. I can't be helped. I am holding these losses as an ant might, as if they are familiar but not quite mine, as if they are books I will be allowed to return to some centralized sadness library. Thank you. Hi. Oh, you came back. <laughs> Never left. Thank you. What a great reading. Hey, thanks. Um, and uh, what a great book. Um, I got the pleasure, uh, the honor maybe is a better word, to read the burden. <laughs> a lot of this <laughs> in manuscript and when you were wrestling with it. Um, and I kind of wanted to start there with yeah. the process of writing it, which I know was, was hard. It was different. How was it different? And how did it transform as you were going along? Um, well, first, thank you for thank you for being here, Kevin Young. Oh, it's a pleasure. Very important, Kevin Young, um, and for reading that 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 early manuscript. I think I think I realized the book was getting bigger and bigger after the jewelry incident. So when the the burglary happened, I thought, what I think with all essays, which is this is going to be a doozy of an essay, but I want it to be even at that level of having something really sort of concrete and sort of terrible happen, um, I was like, I really don't know what it's about yet, though. I just didn't have a sense of what it was about. Um, and I thought that would come naturally. I thought it could be sort of in the closed dome of a, of a New York kind of story, right? Because um, as one friend, we have a mutual friend who pointed out to me that the it's like the 70s came back and kicked me in the face um <laughs> <laughs> with the burglary and then russell died and so that was um a bigger bullet point than i had anticipated so the story became really about him and the burglary sort of receded but as you know i was going through drafts when you have these two pieces it's hard not to have that be like a mercury spill that picks up a lot of things so a lot about covid got taken out um, it's so funny. I feel like we have such a um, horror of reading about the pandemic and COVID and probably people from New York talking about the pandemic and COVID that I almost feel more obliged to warn people that there's like a little bit of toilet paper and hand sanitizer than I do about like the warning about the shocking death. You know? <laughs> um, but so really, it really became everything uh, since you read it or even actually part of when you read it became like, is Russell the North Star? How is this? How is this tie back to Russell? And then everything else got edited out. And the burglary. How did you see that as a? Is it a metaphor? I mean, you know, it's a real thing. I know. <laughs> I, I'm saying, did you did it become a kind of yeah. loss that was easier yeah. to handle, or or did yeah. that sort of become something that just not at you? And I won't give away what sort of happens, but. Yeah, There's a, it, it in and of itself would have made a great the mystery. Essay, yeah. <laughs> um, it's so funny. The question of burglary as metaphor is like such a poet's question. Sorry. <laughs> That's, no, you asked good. me to come here. I asked so, you. I invited I mean, what'd you. you like, what did you want from me? Um, no, it's a good one. I mean, I think that. Um, there's the obvious thing about feeling like when someone dies very suddenly um, of their own volition or not, it can feel like something was stolen from you. Um, and it's just, you had it one day and then you don't. There's, it's, I describe it later in the book as Matthew work backwards instead of forwards and try to figure out what happened uh, in reverse, which makes it a strange sort of almost unnatural death because it's not the line of time, um, just for the, for the mourner. Um, and I feel like with the jewelry, what happened was I never really put, you know, I read The Year of Magical Thinking, I read Truth and Beauty, you know, all the, the sort of beautiful grief memoirs we're familiar with, and the truth is, is that my cynical self, even at the depths of those memoirs, when, you know, she describes magical thinking, mm -hmm. I'm like, eh, 
Does she? I mean, I, I mean, I, I just have had difficulty believing there's a part in uh, this is the answer to your question. Believe it or not, there's a part in um, the Year of Magical Thinking where she talks about um, after John Gregory Dunn dies, Julia Child dies, and she thinks, oh, good, John and Julia can have dinner in heaven. I'm like, eh, did you really think this? You know, and then this happened, and I really felt that if I could somehow get some of the jewelry back, it would stop what I call the bleed of loss. And I didn't really think that Russell was gonna sort of reconstitute himself like a hologram. I just, it wasn't even his necklace. Um, I just somehow really felt that some sort of wrong could be righted, like a little bit um, could be shaved off if I just got the necklace back. Sure, and, and you made clear in that part, which was funnier than you said, by the way. The opening? Uh, yeah, the opening. Oh, thanks. Um, I heard a lot of laughs. Um, <laughs> These people are dark. That's why. <laughs> They're very sick, sick people. <laughs> Welcome to D.C. <laughs> um, I guess what I would, I, you know, so I want to ask about humor, but I also, also want to ask about something you just mentioned, which yeah. is, these other grief memoirs and you know, also this idea, which I think I relate to personally, when my father died very suddenly, I really wanted to get all of his like things. You know, so I went around to dry cleaners. Like, oh, wow. do you have his dry cleaning? Yeah. Do you have this? You know, and it, there was something about almost like putting Osiris together or you know, like having it all, yeah, um, business left unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's maybe more questions than answers though you explore it. What about these other grief memoirs? I mean, did you were there some you you know felt like were useful, or did you feel like some were uh, to be avoided? You right. know, how did you r reckon with that? <laughs> Let's not call trash. it a tradition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, oh, there's only one you need um, for your journeys. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. That so so well, there's sort of two levels. Uh, there's what's in the book, the reckoning in the book, and then my own personal reckoning. So I'll sort of work it backwards, which is to say that. I do mention some of the more self-help books that I ended up reading, um, which I don't know, they sort of bounced straight off my temperament. And it's not that they're not helpful. Sure. That's sort of what I want to be clear about with the book is that you know if anyone is experiencing grief, like if that helps you, if you find any piece of information in self-help, take it. Um, it just for me, I found them so general. So general, because they are general, because they're not about a specific person. They're like, how do you, you know, apply this sort of structure of thinking to help you through something, um, which has its use, but that's not necessarily what this book is. Um, but I found I miss my specific friend, you know, very much. And so I found the memoirs also that I personally gravitated towards, or the stories, were so specific, because that's the thing, is we wouldn't miss them if they were one note, and you wouldn't be sad if you were sad in one note. So. I loved, um, I really loved Ann Patchett's Truth and Beauty. Um, I've actually just started reading Stay True. It's really good. Um, weirdly, fiction. Uh, there's a book uh, called All My Puny Sorrows, and the problem is I'm going to butcher the author's last name because it's spelled very differently than it's pronounced. It's Miriam Taves, but it's T-O-W. It's the woman who wrote Women Talking. Um, that's fantastic because you feel like you miss the person too. There's this sort of transitive property um but yeah so that's that's my memoir reading experience i'm not a big memoir reader outside of this the only memoir i've ever read uh well not only memoir i've ever read that <laughs> yeah you've just said some others so the most recent the only audiobook i've ever downloaded was britney spears's really memoir i just i don't know just yeah fair enough sure i have a breadth of interests right <laughs> 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 well what about um you know humor yeah. Did you feel, you know, I, I do feel like there were moments when I was writing personally uh, about loss that mm -hmm. humor came through. And I, my first impulse was to take it out. You know, this is of too serious. Yeah, yeah, like this this is yeah. a serious, somber matter. But sometimes the person was hilarious that you're trying to conjure. Yeah. Sometimes, and you, I think, do a great job of conjuring Russell. But also, like, tell me about, like, how yeah. you approach it as a sometimes thought of as comic writer. I imagine that's more challenging for you because you're also quite lyrical, obviously, literally. I mean, you're very poetic. What? I'm just a c comedian, too. Okay, so. fine. But, but you have a choice. Like, you have a, you have a couple of uh, more arrows in your quiver or I whatever see. than I do. So I feel like you might be like, oh, well, this might be a better approach seriously and just as vividly in a more sort of um, 
traditionally beautiful fashion. I don't have that that much. And so my analogies and the humor are how I see the world and are how I describe things. And so in replace of an analogy or something sort of, you know, anything profound ends up coming out of the, the humor. So I didn't feel the need to strip it out with this. I think that there's an assumption that I would, but for me, this is what I think of the book when I think well of it, you know, like anything, sometimes you're like, what is this? <laughs> and sometimes you think very well of it when, I, when I'm in one of those moods. I think this is quite tragically, obviously I would trade the person for the book, but I think this is providing a texture that my work hasn't had before because it's the same exact tone as I would describe anything. It's just that the texture with the topic, I think makes it glow more. Um, and I never felt self-conscious about the humor. I mean, there are a couple of, yeah, there's some dark, there's some dark jokes, uh, you know, for, but I do, you know, sometimes I think, oh, I wonder if this will offend people yeah. who have lost somebody and I'm one of them, you know, <laughs> but because you, you, but you can't really live your life in fear of that. Yeah. Well said. What about the title? I'm a, I'm a title doctor. Uh, Are you? For, for From other friends? Yeah. Hey, I didn't have to be a title. Can you say some of them? I, no, I can't. I can't hear. Uh, maybe over dinner. Or, okay. You know. Not in this um, form. Yeah. But I certainly love a good title. And I think this title is so interesting. Not in the Midwestern way. Like, oh, how interesting. I was about you, to say. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, so complicated because on the one hand, it's a very simple statement. On the other hand, it seems like only your statement, you know? And I wonder how you came to it and, and what it, has it changed in its resonance? What's, it, what's the resonance for you? Yeah, it has a couple of, uh, it's a bit of a workhorse. Um, a, it's very blunt, um, but also uh, in a way, it's both proved correct and incorrect throughout the course of the book, so it shifts. So I, after the burglary, was obviously quite upset and trying to, you know, solve the mystery of it and, and felt sort of violated by the entire experience. Um, and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could find at some point, I was like a grief group. I don't want to bore my friends with this anymore. And it seems both like too big for to just pretend it was like a smash car wheelchair, uh, windshield, wheelchair, a smash car wheelchair. Yeah. Don't, don't name don't name of my jam band. Um, but no, um, but you know, I didn't know what to do with it. So yeah. I, I was like, oh, maybe I can find a grief group. But of course, there are no grief groups for stuff. <laughs> uh, and then uh, that's where the title is written in the book, where then Russell dies. And there are endless options, yeah. because that's what it's for. Um, but the truth is, is that a lot of the book is about sort of getting purchase on what is grief for? I am the friend. I am not the partner. I am not the mother. I'm not the nephew. And so I'm like, I felt this extra layer while I was so upset of trying to figure out like who gets to grieve what. Um, and so that's sort of the, and, uh, but there is sort of a silent uh, thing that I'm ignoring that I never talk about, but I will talk about here, which is also pets. <laughs> yeah. But uh, aside from that, yes, grief is for people. Well, but you, you kind of hint at this when in, even in the opening section you read to us, which is fish don't have these problems. You know, no, they don't. You, you, you I don't have, think you, so. You, <laughs> you have denial <laughs> and, and these phases. And yeah. were you conscious of those phases? Did those come later? Or, you know, I think when work. you're in denial, do you know you're in denial? I don't know. I no. think, um, <laughs> yeah. So, how did you wrestle with that later? And did that help to think, oh, that was a phase that yeah. I was in, or I'm in now still, and but I'm writing about it? I mean, grief. I think is is very much sort of like a, a perfume smells different on everyone and mine smells like still sometimes in denial <laughs> like sometimes I'm actually like is he in the bathroom with a bad oyster like genuinely I have a this real sure. shock that my friend is not here because he was such a sort of larger than life kind of person but really the stages you know you can read them earnestly you can read them as a bit uh, cheeky um, you know, they're flipped 
from the traditional stages. There's the five stages of grief. You know, I think that everyone agrees they've been sort of debunked as having like, you know, these definitive lines, but they still exist. Although someone recently told me on a side note that they were originally meant for a dying person. Yes. Which makes I, a I whole lot Kugler more Ross, sense. Um, when my fa- and read yes. through it and I was like, what? You know, like, yeah, which makes it's so totally much sense. Like, but... like what, what does the grieving person have to accept or deny? It seems like a person who's dying has a yeah. lot more to chew on, you know? Um, but so I switched them a little bit instead of acceptance as afterward. But really the reason when I knew I was going to use them is without spoiling it too much, uh, is bargaining. Yeah. So bargaining worked in a sort of literal and metaphorical way, like nothing I've, else I've ever worked on. And I knew the others would have sort of fall into place afterwards because yeah. I'm trying to get my jewelry back and I am trying to figure out if my friend is really dead. Right. Those are literal bargaining. Well, what about Russell? I mean, it's such a beautiful um, tribute. You talked to him at one point. You know, you're addressing him directly. Did he change or, you know, did you feel his presence in some way? I mean, I don't mean it in a woo-woo way, but in in a kind of, you know, as you're writing it, you know, you're trying to get him right, I'm sure, for others. Oh, yeah. And I remember yeah. talking with you about it before I read the book, and I feel like you, you managed that so beautifully. Thank you. Um, yeah, it changed, it changed a little bit. I think that... I think I wrote the book, and it's ex- definitely just on a personal note, sort of on a personal note. Like, the whole thing isn't a personal <laughs> note. What an impersonal note. <laughs> <laughs> what else have we been talking about? But um, the I wrote it, and I remember writing the last paragraph and thinking, now we can begin, that I had delayed something. Because when someone dies by suicide, I talk in the anger section about anger not, not forthcoming. I instantly forgave him. I am not mad at him. And yet, I think the whole book is really angry. <laughs> But in a funny way. Um, but it is, it is in fact, a sort of I didn't feel like he got enough credit in life. A lot of the book is about a tribute to people who work sort of behind the scenes in the arts, you know, the unfamous ones. Um, and he didn't really get a proper obituary. And I like to joke to friends that I got 200 pages worth of real mad that, you know, this didn't happen. So he, I feel like... I, I felt more in communication with him through the book. But it's different than catharsis. I felt like I got to say a proper goodbye to him through the book, but I don't necessarily feel better. Right. I that, find that was a question weird. here. I should cro- I cross that off. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, how did grief change you? Um, or did it? It did a little bit. Uh, you know, people say you become more human for the experience. And, you know, my thing is I'm like, I'm whatever level of human I'm at is fine. <laughs> I do not need more of this, whatever this is, you know, I'm like, I didn't want it. So, but I, but it's like a course I did not sign up for, Absolutely. you know, and that's how it feels. I'm sure you feel the same way. You're like, well, I guess I can check this off the list, but it does make you the, the specific kind of grief it is honestly does make you listen more. I don't think in terms of guilt, when someone dies by suicide, I don't think I had the power to stop like a perfectly cogent 52 year old man from taking his own life. I do, however, think I have the power going forward to list. I hear on a different frequency, I think for other people. That's beautifully said. Thanks. Do you want to just, is there a capsule two sentence description of him? Of Russell? Yeah. I yeah, that, even, yeah. Because you know, is, I, I, I know you guys don't know, <laughs> but I, I, you know, just give us a short version of him yeah. and what he yeah, was like. That's a thank you. That's a good question. Um, because I just keep talking about specificity without becoming specific myself. Um, so he was my boss at Vintage Books, uh, which is a uh, the paperback arm of Knopf and Random House for 10 years. Um, and a lot of books that you've probably read or heard of, you have heard of because of him. He got a lot of things back into print. Um, Stoner by John Williams, that was a big one for him. Um, Anniversaries. He found out that the 50th anniversary of Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart was coming up. And he's like, oh, it'd be kind of cool if we did something. But of course, this is someone who did nothing halfway. And next thing you know, we're at Town Hall in New York. And it's um, Chimanda Adiche, uh, Chris Abani, T- oh, Tony Morrison. That was a oh, good one. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just counting it. Ha Jin. Like yeah. these, yeah. <laughs> a few Tony, important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was, she was, she was pretty important. And Jim Wachebe was still alive, so he also was was there. It was amazing. But he did that. 
he made that happen. He contacted Penn. He did the whole thing. Um, and he was, so he was incredibly passionate about books the way you associate, you know, not working in publishing, probably presumably most of you, you associate from pop culture like writers or editors are. It was, he really felt the way I felt when I first started working in books, but then it gets beaten out of you, this feeling that you're like, I'm gonna make people read. <laughs> people will read again. And you're Absolutely. like, oh man, and you're just beaten, beaten, beaten. Um, not you guys, obviously. Yeah, no, um, we're in a but temple he, to books. He, yeah, of course, of books. but he, he felt he could do it. He's yeah. like, I'm gonna make America read what I want them to read. And having said all that, he was a very energetic, very abrasive <laughs> person. Um, he was wildly offensive um, and he fit less and less into this sort of world that he had built and in some ways that was a good thing certain things needed to not be said at work um, at one point my assistant walked into a meeting with this cardigan that was a little tight and he looked at her and he was so quick too quick and he said oh my god it's like you walked into Talbot's and said give me the sluttiest thing you have <laughs> I was like, oh, no. And this is way before me, too. And I sort of pulled her aside afterwards. I'm like, hey, if he ever says anything, let me know. And she was okay. She's like, you know, he was also fighting for her raise. He wasn't, like, lording anything over her. But um, I think part of his death was feeling like his sort of the terrain and sort of topography of his playground was shrinking. And he didn't mean to hurt anyone, but he didn't know what to do about it. Well, this this idea of hurting is is in the book, and, and that's well said. Um, just a couple more questions, and then I want to take some questions from the audience. Um, one is is really about sort of the moment you you said you took a lot of it out, but of COVID, when oh, you were writing it, how did that impact? Um, besides the fact that if I saw you, it would be like on Zoom or. Yeah. In a park, you know, cocktails separated on by, Zoom, yeah, isn't that sad? Se you know, <laughs> sixteen feet away, or however much it was. Yeah. But you know, we all were going through this grieving process. Yes. And were you thinking about that while you were writing or editing the book? Yeah, it's such a good question, Kevin. Um, yeah, because I was really self-conscious of the fact that once I enter into COVID, like yes, other people have had people they've loved die by suicide. It doesn't have to be suicide; die in general. I'm also not the only one to be burglarized, but I felt comfortable with how much I owned of those stories. And then once you enter into COVID, I'm like, this is happening to everyone on the planet. Yeah. And so I was incredibly self-conscious in, about how to describe it, how not to get repetitive with it, and to keep Russell as my, as my North Star through it because I live on the same block as the restaurant where I last saw him, which was then boarded up during COVID. There were all these things that like connected like in a sort of hook or a straight line through him. Um, but I did end up taking out a lot. I mean, frankly, I took out a lot because I wanted to make it a year without saying it mm -hmm. because there was a whole trend, you know, of my year of fill in the blank, you know? Um, and I, it's technically a year, but I didn't. And then the other thing is, I ended it, it, ended it, I can say that word, ended it, ended it. I, it's also edited is also difficult. Yeah. I edited it and ended it, um, frankly, before May 25th, before uh, I ended it before Black Lives Matter, because I'm like, oh, right. the Black Lives Matter, and the entire, and George Floyd and all of it, because yeah. I was like, this is. You don't mean you ended it. the writing, you mean you ended the account. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 sorry. Because I do remember there was a moment when some yeah. of that had been yeah. in, not necessarily the book, but things yes. you were writing. Yeah, and I thought, for all the obvious reasons that you would guess, I'm like, this is, it's not about necessarily being unqualified, although it is, but this becomes a story that's, it's too giant. I can't get it in here. And so I just, I took it out. Well, thank you so much for uh, answering my questions. I know we'll have people ask from the audience. There is a microphone up here, if you can't see it, right behind this pillar. Uh, if you don't mind getting up, though, we can also bring you a mic if, if you need to. Any questions for Sloan? Small oh, or big? The first one. Here we go. Oh, hi. Can you tell us a little bit more about the editing process and just how hard it was to pare back most writers say that is the hardest. And you, were you were was your editor enthusiastic 
about your cutting back or were, was your editor asking you to cut more? Oh, that's a very good question. Very good. Um, <laughs> oh, man, I wish he was here right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, he always wants me to, to cut. Um, usually he wants me to cut jokes. Um, <laughs> Where I will Has write. He him. met you. I mean. What? Yeah. No. He definitely met me. Um. Where I'll like write. I'll just argue over something. I'll be like, no, no, no. This is really funny, or this is the funniest thing I've you know ever written. And he'll forward me an email I sent him six months prior saying this is the funniest thing I've ever written. And I'm like, okay, no comment. <laughs> like, um. But no, he. I think a lot of the edits were about encouragement this time. I think in the past it's been about paring down and this one was about um, becoming more vulnerable, which I have an issue with it, not uh, just because I think it gets tied up with confessional writing, which I don't particularly love. Um, I just, you know, I, and so I think it was about sort of going deeper into those, into those places a little bit. Um, but other things that got edited out were just sort of distractions, you know, especially once I hit certain, um, there's certain topics where you can touch them and the whole board lights up for me. And that includes like, let's say book publishing gossip, you know, <laughs> and that, and that I, you know, wanted to talk a little bit more. I'm like, this happened and this happened and this happened. And it just became so inside baseball. And so, um, for the fact that other people are relating to it, I think you have more him to thank than me. Um, so that, you know, I don't describe you know, every position there is at Random House. <laughs> yeah. What else uh, do people want to ask? People want to ask questions. Yeah. Sometimes they can be shy. Oh, no, there's a person. Oh, no, I was a teacher for a long time. So yeah, you got to wait. You got to wait a minute. You got to wait. And then a wonderful person will ask. Hi. 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 Um, <laughs> so I guess this, your last answer kind of raised this question, but I feel like especially online and um, online magazines, you know, we're kind of in this, like, personal essays are a really big thing about people sharing these intense moments in their lives and decisions and problems. How did you, I mean, obviously you have sh written lots of personal essays, but I guess not for such a emotional topic, mm. I guess. How did you come to feeling like this was something that you could share, you know, in print and permanently <laughs> and for everyone? Um, well, thank you. That's a very Great good question. question. Yeah. Um, so I do think that there is something that, you know, friends to be, I mean, this is a nice warm audience. I have friends have been almost concerned where they're like, what's it going to be like promoting this book and, and, you know, answering questions, all this stuff. And I'm like, I do think I have this weird training with the three books of essays so that the conclusion is different. You know, the topic is different, but the math is quite similar. So the math, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so the math is basically that, you know, you're sharing a personal story and you're used to a certain kind of measure of revealing of yourself, if that makes sense. And so I'm sort of used to this entire thing in a way, just, it, it's just a different thing I'm attacking. I'm no, that wasn't very articulate for someone who's written a bunch of these <laughs> essays. But in terms of the boom, there's, there's also like, it's all, there's always a boom been a boom since like Montaigne like the, <laughs> it's like there's always a there's always a boom of like personal confession and then there's always this sort of criticism of us oh is it real writing is it essay writing is it like a diary entry and I think it's just do you enjoy it then it's real writing <laughs> so Hi. Um, is this book mostly taking place uh, in an office setting or how about your home setting maybe spouse or children or other family members that's a very good question. Um, you know, who's who else? Who's witness to all of this? Um, so there are scenes in the um, office, and thank you for that question too. Um, there are scenes in the office, but there's also a lot of um, outside the office because this friendship continued to spending weekends together. Um, it takes place in New York, and then in terms of others, I do write about other people. I write about um, his partner. I write about this friend group that we had, um, but I'm very careful in the book to never speak for them. You know, where there's even a bit where I say something along the lines of, you know, I saw his partner at the memorial service and we hugged each other. And I think about all the things that I don't know about their relationship. And I say that's someone else's love story. You know, it's not it's not mine. Um, but 
I mean, everybody's been sent the book. Everyone, there's no surprises. But yeah, mostly I guess setting-wise, the greater tri-state area. It's it's in New York and um, a little bit of Connecticut and a little bit of childhood. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting for someone else to ask a question, I was going to ask you: Is this a New yeah. York book? Oh man! Like and and you know because there's yeah. that other genre of you know here I am in the city. Oh, and that's as so you, wild. <laughs> yeah, girl, wild in the city. Just, no, just no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I I mean, but really. You know, it's a portrait of a city yeah. at a certain moment. Yeah, it is. And I did you think, think about is. that? I think I knew it would come through osmosis because I don't have to try for that. Do you know what I mean? I'm trying to tell the story of a friend. I'm trying to paint the picture of someone. I'm trying to paint the depths of grief. And those are things I haven't really sort of tackled. But I know that the New York will just come after it. I think the COVID section, actually sort of an answer to your other question, in addition to Russell's My North Star knowing that it was such um, a sort of, I really hate saying this, like a love letter to New York. I feel like I'm a wretch. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, but it becomes, it sure. becomes about the city that gave me this, this incredible family in Russell and then also took it away. Well said. Any other questions? I we love have all these questions. The back, yeah. This is you guys are wonderful. Sorry to put too much pressure on you. <laughs> no, no. I was just curious whether Russell had family and whether there was any pushback or how they felt yeah. about the writing of this book and 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 how you whether that was in the back of your mind as yeah. you were writing it. No, it's a great question. Well, I mean, the overall answer is that I uh, go out of my way to not speak for them in the book, and that's obviously going to continue uh, to this moment. Um, but yes, he has a, a, a wonderful mother who I don't know if she's read it yet. She was sent it. And then I've been in pretty constant contact with his partner as well. Uh, so he knows he knows everything. Um, and I have not talked to like his extended family. <laughs> but but um, yeah, so that they're all they're all very, very aware of it. Um, and actually, I was just emailing with his partner today. I think there's another question or two. Yeah, please. Oh, okay. I think you, you're gonna. Oh, have she's a gonna. Few she's more. gonna have to go. Yeah, yeah. You made a gesture with your hand that made it sound like you were out of here. No, I thought she. I didn't no, know if she was going. No. She's like, and I'm that done. That was the last straw. And I'm done. Cross and I'm like, No, really, I can show you the email from the partner. It's fine. Like, I, it's just, <laughs> I just beat her to the mic. Um, this is kind of a similar question, but do you ever feel like you needed permission or like towing that line? Like people are aware you're very clear. You're not speaking for them, but you mentioned earlier, like as a friend, like what role do I have in this? Sorry, I'm getting emotional. I shouldn't have to worry about crying in a book reading about grief, but um, <laughs> that, that sense of like, do I have permission to write this? And how did you do this so soon after you lost him? And I'm really sorry for your loss <laughs> and yours. And Oliver's probably. Be beautifully <laughs> said. Thank you. I have a hunch. I am sorry for yours too. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, oh, you made me now. Now you're distracting me with your tears. No, <laughs> um, no I think that you know. I started taking notes soon in the the suppose the Nora Ephron everything is copy tradition. You know, take notes. Um, that doesn't mean you have to have it fully formulated at all. And what's funny about it is I think that because the burglary had been this strange precursor, that again, just so there's, maybe it's a little late to say this, but I am not confused about which is the greater loss. Um, because it had been that, I had already been thinking in this way for a while, um, but not that long. When I talk to other people who have lost loved ones by suicide, and I have already a fair amount, even though today is the day uh, it comes out, which is also very weirdly, if you remember from the reading, a 27th. Um, I don't, I didn't realize I was sort of in my plebe year, you know? And I think what has to happen, there's a great Capote quote where he talks about how all your tears should be dry by the time you set pen to paper. And like not to question German Capote, but um, I don't <laughs> totally... Yeah, you know, I mean, was he gonna fight back? Um, <laughs> I feel I do feel a slight. I know what he means, but I think you need a few like crumpled tissues nearby because I don't think I could write this book now. I don't think I could. Um, 
you need a little bit of access to the part that is not ready. So thank you for your question. Beautifully put. Thanks. Very supportive. Um, this Hi. is more of a question about all of the things that you write. How is um, the experience, how is writing fiction different for you than, I mean, there are some obvious answers, I'm sure, but, um, yeah. you know, what, how, how do you decide where you're going to go in your mind to the true stuff or the not true stuff? That's a very good question. I sound like I'm filibustering like a politician. I'm so happy you asked that because I don't know the answer. Um, no, I think that, uh, oh, hi. Um, I think that, you know, in a uh, sort of broad sweeping level, you know, if you're going to write a novel or you're going to write nonfiction. Um, and then on a sort of more micro level, things can go anywhere. So there's like only so many ways to say I did this. Like I knocked on this. You know, it's going to look the same in every, it's just because it's, how you would describe doing that. Um, but for this, you know, I was working on, I handed in my last novel, Cult Classic, on March 1st, 2020. So I was like, oh, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> you know, the publishing house is like, we might not be able to print it. There might be zombies. We're just gonna, we're gonna go roll the dice. Um, and uh, it sort of overlaps a little bit. So there are themes weirdly from this that exist in cult classic. There's a heroine who is very close to her boss. Um, and then he, uh, something bad happens to him. Um, and I think, I think that I, but I had started writing it before, before this. So I think when I think of that fact, I think, oh, this is actually a book about life and joy and a tribute to this friendship because I was trying to do it before anything bad had happened. I mean, bad things had happened, but nothing real bad. And so I think that that choice of how to do it, in a way you keep trying to retell the same story again and again. And I think a lot of authors and a lot of musicians, artists do the same thing, where if you, that's why you get the books about, oh, there are periods, there are themes, there's something that has stuck in your craw and you just keep trying to get it out. Um, and so I do think I will probably revisit this. I don't think I'm going to write another grief memoir. I think this is, I think we're, we're at a max capacity for my ability to do this. <laughs> but I hope that answers roughly the question. I think the thing about an elegy is no one plans to write it. You know, you never, yeah. it's not like you're like, you know what I want to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and just I, wait. I do think like sometimes you're just doing the thing you know how to do, which mm -hmm. is right. You know, like, how do you respond? How do you wrestle with it? If I was a good baker, I'd bake about it, you know, if that makes sense. And yeah. in some ways, um, it's those small, comforting things that, that get you through. And um, is there anything you, you know, turn to that gets you through that isn't the writing? Because I, I, like, huh. started, you know, during COVID, started yeah, what like did you get I got a ton of plants. Like, I have plants everywhere now. Do you? People are like, you have a green thumb. I'm like, really? Because I started three years ago, you know? Do you still have the same plants? I, yeah, they're bigger than ever. I was about ever. to say, yeah, I was like, I moved them down you don't here. have a green thumb if you just keep <laughs> getting plants. That's not how that works. <laughs> like, you know, what happens is you get, uh, like, you know, you're like, you know what? That corner hasn't been taken over entirely. <laughs> but are there other things that, you know, are, are for yeah. you uh, comforting? Oh, man, I really want a good answer to this. And I want the answer to be healthy and not no, Netflix. No, yeah, Netflix is a... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And not binge watching TV. And um, I think that, you know, I started reading older essays. Mm. Um, like, not older, older, but like Vivian Gornick, things like that. Um, or some of John Jeremiah Sullivan's earlier stuff. Just to feel like <sighs> the sense of just to get into someone looking at something, at something else. But it wasn't a total deviation. I wasn't like, oh, now I'm going to read a lot of the great novels yeah. to, to sort of take myself out of this. I just wanted to, I think, bolster the idea that, you know, when you write about something where the most common vowel is I, no matter what you're writing about for long enough, you're like, who can stand this? <laughs> Do you know if you have, if, as long as you're not a monster, you know, you think who can, and then you read these other works by other sort of narrative nonfiction writers specifically that had nothing to do with necessarily grief. Right. Although again, I really highly recommend All My Puny Sorrows. It's fantastic. It's, it's funny and dark. Um, but yeah, just sort of seeing through someone else's lens. 
Any last question before I have one more question? Oh, I, I see one. Wait, wait for the mic because they're uh, about the memorial service. Yes. Could you speak but, into the mic because they're taping it? Oh, okay. Can you say a little bit more about the memorial service, or is that really fully covered in the book? Or? Uh, sure. Um, can I ask? Can I ask why? Uh, I'm just I, curious. I used I'm to be a hospice chaplain. I've studied all kinds of you know the okay. psychological literature of loss and separation. Okay. And guilt, guilt, grief, etc. My wife died two years ago, and uh, my son last year said, why don't you move down to this area so I can be with my grandchildren. And the grief group that I belong to up in New Bedford, Mass, uh, said, you can't leave us. <laughs> you know, they said, it's too soon. You'll, you'll really screw things up because there's this rigid system we follow in grieving. <laughs> And, and the second worst, second year is the worst one of all, you know. I see. I said, I'm sorry, but I'm doing it. Well, I'm happy you're here to ask the question. I'm very sorry for your for your loss as well. I think that uh, a couple things. I agree about the second year thing, and then I'll answer your question about the memorial service because that's when people stop asking you, "Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm okay." You know, here's your here's the notes, here's the condolence cards, and then just when it's actually hitting you. People have not forgotten about you, but they've, you know, they're not hounding you. Um, so the memorial service was, it is covered in the book. Um, but again, this is so much about my friendship and my reaction uh, to my friend's loss. Um, so he did have a memorial service. It was quite a big one. Um, it was a little bit late in terms of timing. Um, he died in July. We had it in October. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. But, uh, yeah, I turned into what I describe in the book as I say, you know, is there such a thing as a funeral zilla? I went insane. <laughs> you know, I wanted, I was like, I was like, we need programs, they need to have ribbon. Is it hard to shut down Fifth Avenue for an hour? Actually, maybe we should have it just at a restaurant and no, you know, only his favorite foods and nobody make a speech if it's bad. And, do, you know, I mean, I just like a, just a crazy person, yeah. you know, and eventually, um, it was actually the first, I'm glad you asked, because it's also the first time I think it really, I kind of got it through my skull that the living are more important you know, than the person who died. Other people need this, and not just his six favorite people. Right. Other people need this. This is important, and this sort of weird loyalty you have right when someone you love dies, you're just like, that is the most important person, and it's, it's not. It's everyone around you. And so the memorial service was the first time I really understood that. Yeah. My wife was a poet and also an English teacher, taught a lot of kids writing. Many of them went on to publish books and so forth. Um, and so when we got to the memorial service, we, we also delayed it. Uh, she died in, on September 11th, 2022, ironically. And uh, by the way, material things do matter. One of the sweetest things that happened at that, that moment was there was one really horrible thing that happened, but the uh, nurse that had taken care of my wife uh, af before I got there uh, to the emergency room, uh, she, she, she said, you're going to want this. Mm. And she just handed it to me. And well, I'm glad she sure. did. Thank you. That's beautiful. And we used all sorts of great poetry for the oh great yeah, for the service did you write that book called the art of losing yeah i edited that that is yeah. awesome oh thank you <laughs> that is uh, uh, a little nice right plug here. but yeah. no i love where, it where i lived in new bedford the yeah. death rate was 100% oh but, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> i know it's not nearly that <laughs> high in around dc yeah, yeah, so. but that that is a beautiful book well, thank you thanks a lot thank you Su so much such a great combination to have the two of you together talking thanks about a lot this. thank that, you I that's mean, uh, really nice we should probably end there and not uh, yeah, risk uh, any. Yeah, and I was going to ask No you one plans for an elegy and no one just waits until their book yeah, is plugged. Yeah, yeah. Just wait. <laughs> well, uh, Except J.D. Vance. Yeah, nice. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, should I ask you one last question? Yes, ask me one yeah, last yeah. question. And this is more of a fun question. Leo. So I was going to start with this question, which is, how does it feel to be famous? Um, oh, my God. <laughs> we have a joke about who's fancier, and I think yeah, that he, yeah. Kevin wins by but a mile. But the, the other last thing is just, you were in... In New York Magazine in that quadrant thing. Oh yeah, the Matrix. Yeah, what ma What part of the Matrix were you in? I was in uh, 
highbrow brilliant. See. Did, that's not cool. That is very cool. That was not cool. That You're is very like cool. <laughs> I, I I was very impressed. So I think I think lowbrow brilliant is really the yeah well where you want to be. You can aspire away. Yeah. Uh, Britney Spears downloading. That's what I'm saying. Um, but grief is for people. What a beautiful Thank book, you. and you know you heard all the responses here. So make sure you get it, and yeah. and, and sign, you're signing sign books them. right now. So thank you all for coming. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you to Kevin, who is the fanciest person here. <laughs>